<laughs> so, Sophia, where and when were you born? Uh, I was born in San Jose, Costa Rica, and on April, no, August 26th in 98. So, August 26th makes you a Virgo in terms of sun yes. sign. And do you identify yes, at all with, with being a Virgo? To be honest, I don't know what exactly, like, you know, how the Virgo is. So it's like, I don't know. Like, I, I don't I think follow of them, this zodiac sign. I think of them as being um, a very communicative, interested in people, detail-oriented, mm -hmm. um, sensitive, kind of caring people. I think that I am. Yeah. <laughs> I am very sensitive. Actually, I I can, like, I don't know, I'm watching, I mean, um, before this intro, like, conversation, I was watching the movie, like, One Direction movie, and when, you know, back in my ages, when I was, like, 13 years old, I was a huge fan of One Direction. So I started crying. So I think that I'm very sensitive. I mean, we're talking about a movie. So it, it isn't about a movie of poopies or someone like in a TV war, we were talking about like, you know, a boy band. So it's very funny because I'm very sensitive. And not because of that, I'm just like giving an example to like point it out how sensitive I am. And also I think I'm very caring. Maybe it's just because I'm an active, I'm an activist. I think that if you are an activist, it's because you care about people. And also, yeah, I think that I'm a beer girl. <laughs> Um, what other words would you use to describe yourself for someone who doesn't know you in terms of your I'm personality? Very, I'm very shy, to be honest. Right. Like, you know, yeah, it's pretty weird because um, when I started, like, joining the, you know, the climate activism movement, my mom was like, are you, like, are you sure about this? And I was like, what? Because she and she said, I'm not saying that you can do it. Yeah, you can do it, and you have all the capability of doing it. But you will need to have like a speaker and like you know talking to the crowd and to people and even your government. So are you sure about this? Because I know you're very shy. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, I mean, I mean, I need to do it. So I will. This is going to be like a test for me. But in terms of like, I've been like doing this for about two years. And now I'm less shy, but I'm always be, like before having an interview or I don't know giving I don't know a speech or talking like with people beforehand. I'm like, yeah, Sophia, you can do this. You can do this. Don't be shy. You can do it, and I do it. I will do it. But I'm I'm always like afraid, like internally afraid. Like, no, I'm, I can do it. I'm I'm good with this. <laughs> I'm very shy. Yeah. Well, I think I globally, mm -hmm. one of the main fears people have is public speaking. So it's a really yeah. common experience that people are afraid to stand up in front of the class and give a presentation or whatever. So I'm interested in what you do. You give yourself a little pep talk. I can do it. I can do yeah. it. Take a deep breath. I'm like Obama. Like in his, he, in his first campaign, I was like, yes, we can. Yes, I can. Something like that. <laughs> There's there's a children's book about a little train and the the train is going up a hill and it goes I think I can I think I can I think I can and then the train it's a children's book it makes it over the hill the little red train. Um, do you have brothers and sisters? Yeah, I have a um, one sister and one brother, but they are like they are like in. Not in their, in their 20s, and they already have like children, so I'm, a, I'm an auntie. Yeah, I'm like, my, they are like step brothers and sisters. My dad got like he got married twice, so I'm you know, they like they are from a different mother, but we we love each other. We don't say that we are step brother because we have a really good bond, so it's good. So, you're you're they're your half siblings. You yes. have the same father, so they're yeah, not. Same. Yeah, they're not. No. I mean, my mom is only my mom. This is not their their mom, it's just my mom. <laughs> right. But yeah, they are step siblings, like half siblings. Yeah. Um, step means that you're not blood related. Oh, yeah. 
So yeah, there, yeah, Philly. Yeah, yeah. Yes, you're right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and how did your English get so good? How so fluent? Oh, it's because I went to a American school, so I, you know, I grew up like talking in English. Even as my father went to, um, he did his, his like masters in England, so I like I grew up in, you know, in this kind of um, like environment if that makes sense. Were, yeah. were you, did you live in England at all when he was in graduate school? No, no, no. Unfortunately, no. I wanted to because I love England, but no. <laughs> uh huh. Uh, so when when you dream, do you dream in Spanish and English? Are you aware? What do you dream in? I'm curious. Um, to be honest, in Spanish. <laughs> I actually talk in Spanish, like you know, in a real conversation with my friends, with my family. I'm like, hey, I'm going to like say a sentence in Spanish just to like you know about like how I actually speak or talk. I'm like. Hey, mommy, is puedo ir a la playa with my friends? Something like that. <laughs> like, mom, can I go to the beach with my with to the beach with my friends? Something like that. Right. But, like in a really weird um Spanish. Or sometimes I forget like words in Spanish. So I'm like, yeah, see, sí, mommy, but um, el mall está muy overcrowded. And my mom is like. Why, Sophia? Why? And I'm like, I'm sorry, I just forget. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Um, and then what two years ago happened that got you to be interested in climate change and think, oh, I've got to do something about this? Oh, no, maybe because I grew up, well, my dad is a lawyer and my mom is a, she's a psychiatrist. So they like they are not specifically like activists, but they when I was you know since I'm a kid you know like all my entire life I grew up in this environment like yeah you need to advocate for people you need to help people you need to be caring and um, I don't know my dad is he's a huge fan of human rights like he's always advocating for his job so I grew up in this like kind of like. I don't know, like environment that, yeah, I need to advocate for human rights. So when I went to, like, you know, I started college, I, I, I'm studying, like, I'm majoring in political science. But I don't really like, like, an electoral system or political theory and stuff like that. I'm more into, like, how you can help people through politics. And that's, you know, human rights. So I started, like, you know, I, be, I, be, I started, like, you know, I don't know, like, doing research about migration issues, like, you know, refugees and stuff like that. And I don't know, I was like reading these, um, like in porn about how climate change will affect migration. And I was like, yeah, actually, actually this is, they are right. Because if we, you, I don't know, if, if searching people like, like people from the coastal areas, they are going to face and they are already facing climate change. So they will have this, um, I don't know, like, um, in their will to survive, they will need to migrate. So I'm like, like, yeah, if I want to advocate for migration and refugees, I also need to start doing something to help them to be more resilient. And that's how I, like, I started doing activism. And also my mom, she, she's not from the city. She's from the countryside of Costa Rica. So I grew up in the city. I live in the city. city. But I always had this balance between city and countryside, city and nature. So I always like love nature and I have, I don't know, my best moments in life. I don't know, I happen, you know, not here in the city, but, you know, in the countryside playing with my, I don't know, my cousin playing soccer and getting all dirty and I don't care about being dirty. I don't care about if I broke my leg, but I was in nature, you know, stuff like that. So I grew up with this balance. So I maybe even before I started doing activism, like, you know, real activism, doing really, like doing something, um, like, you know, like very, I don't know how to explain it. Like, yeah, like doing something, like really, really advocating for this. I, before that, before, you know, I don't know, in my entire life, I was already doing something for nature. So 
this is how I like I don't know how to explain it but I didn't like I just woke up and I started doing activism no I think that it was something that all my entire life I've been doing but I haven't like been like yes I'm actually doing something for environment and not only environment as and in nature in ecosystems but also as for we human beings so something like that and and then what group did you find to work with because it's hard to be an activist all by yourself there's more power yeah. in a group so where what triggered you to, to think I want to join such and such yeah, um, in my college we have a environmental club it's not that common and it's, it's not that big but they like they do some activities like you know internally in our college and we have this really well they have a really good bond with indigenous communities with coastal areas and you know stuff like that so I have a friend from my um from my college and from what I'm actually studying and he's part of this group environmental club so we, we started like talking and he said like you can join us so I joined them and you know like doing stuff with them I knew about that Costa Rica already had a chapter in Friday for Future Costa Rica and one of the founders she is also from my college so I contacted her and said like hey I I don't know how like to get involved with Friday for Future in Costa Rica but I'm I'm 100% on board if you want me to like I don't know join you and she's like like yeah sure please actually we need someone from like social sciences and help us with governmental stuff so you are welcome and that's how like I got involved basically and that was about two years ago no with Friday and um, back in September uh, in 2019 yeah um, and when do you graduate? When are you finished with university? Um, to be honest, thanks to the coronavirus pandemic, I'm not sure, but I was going to graduate in October, like this October. Wonderful. But I don't know. Yeah, but I don't know what's going to happen with uh, like graduation stuff and like, um, I don't know, um, Presenting my thesis, and, you know, stuff like that. We will see. I mean, I don't, I don't need to like, I uh, like, I don't know, like, hurry. I'm, I'm only 21 years old, so I have all my life to come. <laughs> and what will you do when you do graduate? What's next? To be honest, I want to like, I don't know, apply to a job or something like that. But also, I want to do a master's. So. It's a really uncertain future, but I the only thing that I'm sure is that I will um, do a master's. I don't know when, how, and where. Um, I don't know, like something related to climate, like environment, or maybe um, human rights. We will see. But yeah, my, actually my dream is to work at Human Rights Watch because they are always doing research about human rights and advocating for human rights. So yeah, that's like my dream. And I know that someday I will make it. I don't know how, but I will make it. <laughs> so it's called Human Rights Watch? It's a global? Yeah, it's, in, yeah, it's global. Actually, it's, in, it's based in New York. Mm -hmm. um, and then what specifically, what actions has Fridays for Future taken in Costa Rica? What, what have you accomplished since you've been working with them? This is very funny and I have a really, really fun experience with Friday for Future because like I told you, I contacted this girl from Friday for Future that she's from a um, college and like two days after that we did our like, you know, Friday strike, the global one back on air, April 20th, I, I don't remember, I don't remember the exact day. But we were, you know, there striking in front of our um, presidential house or like, you know, place. And someone like came out from, you know, where the president is working, I don't know. And he said like, the president wants to talk with five of you. So if you want to go, please, you know, I don't know, choose five people and come with me. So I don't know why they said like, yeah, you should go. So I went with them and 
what we basically talk about with like with our president was about like here in Costa Rica we have a really huge problem with open pit mining. It's not legal in Costa Rica, but you know, I don't know communities and um, in Cruzitas. Cruzitas is the place. Is like you know in the border between you know Costa Rica and Nicaragua. They are doing it even though it, it's not legal, and we have we have a really huge problem with that. But we also have a possible referendum of uh, like on on uh, I don't know how to explain it like. Exploitation, exploration of oil, like oil and, nat and natural gas in our oceans around. So we were like discussing with him about what he thinks about it because this referendum about um, exploration, exploitation is not being led or like it's not being like it's not an initiative exactly from the government. It's more like it from the um, society. So the government has nothing to do with that. But they need to allow it because, like, you know, not allow the referendum, but the process. Because it's part of our constitution. So we were discussing with him about what is, like, what is, like, I don't know, like, if he is, like, okay with this or if not. Because, as you may know, Costa Rica is, like, a really strong leader in environmental and human rights matters. So saying that a president, the president of Costa Rica is okay with having exploration, exploitation of oil, natural gas in our oceans and lands is very, no, it's like very, it's, I don't know, it's like not what we used to say to the world. So it was like very confusing, can be confusing, but we were discussing about this and he helped us to um, like promote some ideas and to, I don't know, like, help us, like, yeah, I'm going to give you a thought in the pre-cup, you know what a pre-cup is? Mm -mm. You know the cup, the conference of parties. Oh, yeah, cup, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, so the pre-cup is the, you know, the pre-conference of parties and was held in Costa Rica last year. So he gave us a thought to go and talk about what's happening and... I don't know, to advocate for that and like inform people about it. So it was good. Yeah. But we're basically like our two common and like main objectives is to um, stop this referendum, but also um, stop or trying to stop the open pit mining problem that we're having. Mm hmm. Um, I think, of, as you said, of Costa Rica as being a leader in environmental policies and um, green, it, it, the government's committed to preserving nature and green spaces, right? Why, why mm -hmm. do you think that is? Why, what, what factors led Costa Rica to be so aware? I would say that Maybe it's because we are actually a really small, small country, but we have like about 3% of the entire um, biodiversity. So we have a lot of biodiversity here. And I don't know, since the beginning of time, like how we do democracy here in Costa Rica, we have this um, like um, basis of yeah, we need to protect the environment. So it's, uh, it's something like that is part of our, not only our political culture, but also as our traditions and like common culture to protect the environment, even though that we are not actually protecting it as we should. So yeah, because you, you can see you know pictures about Costa Rica and yeah, Costa Rica so green. Maybe they don't have pollution. Maybe their rivers are so clean. No, like no, you can like go to San Jose. You can see that San Jose is one of the most polluted capitals in you know entire Latin America. Um, our rivers are so polluted you can see trash in the rivers. Like, you know, you can even smell it. I live near a river and when I'm like, you know, jogging and walking around, I can smell it. So it's very like it's like very confusing because yeah, we say that we are very very environmentalist. Like yeah, if you see someone from Costa Rica you may think that you know, that part of Costa Rica is happy, it's Pura Vida, and the whole idea of Pura Vida also means being Pura Vida with the planet, but not everyone's like that, so very, 
you know, you know how democracy and the system work. <laughs> right. I I think I read that Costa Rica is committed to zero emissions. It, that it that it wants to not pollute or contribute carbon to global warming at all. Yeah, that's true. Actually, uh, the conference bodies, Costa Rica was a leader with, you know, this whole topic and Article 6 and, you know, the carbon emission stuff. And we are um, part of this NGO, I think it is an NGO, that is um, NDC partnership, you know, and this is the national country, in English, national and the determinate contributions that are part of the Paris Agreement that, you know, every single country that assigns the Paris Agreement, they are willing to stop emissions through mitigation, but also adaptation. So the MDC is like their, I would say like their constitution, like how we're going to do this. And Costa Rica is leading that um, process, like more while, without help with other countries, just like, for example, the Netherlands, something like that. So I, I'm confused about why the government would consider the the, act, the extraction of that would pollute the oceans there, the waterways. They're not actually considering, like, like I said, this is not, this is not an idea and it's not being promoted by the government, it's more like from our society. But they can actually like say no, you can do this because it's power uh, is like part of our constitution to give the people choice to um I don't know to I don't know to follow their interests to follow what they think that is best and is a common interest. And the only way to like the government can stop this is to um. I don't know, find this legal gap and say, no, this isn't unconstitutional. But nowadays, until now, they they can, like, do nothing because actually, you know, this whole bill, like, the referendum bill, is well written. So they can, like, say, this is unconstitutional, so please, you can do this anymore. But, yeah. Mm. But they're not, like, um, okay with it. The government is not okay with it. But they can do, like, nothing about it. Mm. Um, it, it, it did Fridays for Future have weekly strikes from school or from university, or did you just strike like the the global big strikes, or how do you how do you do striking? Oh, we we can't actually we can do it um, like weekly because I don't know like here in Costa Rica we don't have a really strong um, like in terms of environment, I'm not saying like in terms of different um, fights and like, you know, advocating for justice, but in terms of um, climate justice, we don't have this really massive culture of protesting, going to strikes, but we, what we actually do is like, I don't know, like we have movie nights or something like that. So it's not like every single Friday, but before COVID, before that you know, when when down with COVID, we used to have like um, I don't know picnics and like informative um, I don't know like I don't know like round tables or something like that or even like virtual. But we like first of all, our educational system is very um, like strict. So if you miss a class the entire day, that will cost you a lot. Not only in school or high school that it's like kind of like mandatory to us go to classes but even with college so I yeah if I go every single Friday and I skip every single Friday you know my classes I will fail the semester but we sometimes we like skip and we say like yeah why I'm going to college I mean I'm going to college but why? Because the planet is already dying, and so it doesn't make any sense. So I, I need a balance, so I can skip a day. I, it like it will cost me my semester, maybe I don't know, but it's worth it. But we don't do it like every single um, Friday. Got it. Um, in the Fridays for Future group that you're involved with, roughly how many people? How many students are involved? 
Uh, like 200. Wait, can you give me a second? I need to open the door. Okay, thank you. Uh, like in Fridays, Fridays, like Fridays itself, we are like about 200, but we like when we do, when we help, like strive, we can see, you can see like more than 200 people. So it's good. And like, are, we are a really small country with a small population. So we're talking about, if we're talking about 200, it's big, like considering that it's Costa Rica. <laughs> And do you include high school students, or is it um, mainly university students? No, we include high school students. We have a, a bunch of high school students, like, you know, the organizers, we are, like, most of, like, the organizers, maybe we are, like, from college, but it's because we, maybe we have, I don't know, the time, time and, like, here in Costa Rica, located for environment, it's very, it's something, like, like only privileged people can do it. It's not like yeah, someone from the coastal area will join Friday for Future. I'm not saying that it's possible. Yeah, it's really possible, and we're really happy with that and open. But advocating, like really advocating for human rights and um, environment in this term, for example, Friday for Future is very privileged. So. Yeah, we like the organizer. We are basically from college. We have like two or three that are part of, um, you know, are from high school. But like in terms of, you know, the whole community of Friday for Future, we you can see people from school, high school, elementary school, and even college. So which is, it's very like you know, it's good. We have a lot of people and with different like ages. And in terms of um, male, female, genders. Roughly, what percent of of the group is female, and what percent of leaders who are doing the real organizing are are young women? Oh, we are a lot of women to do this. <laughs> like, we are, you know, yeah, we are mostly women than 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 men, which is good. I think we well, need more women in this is like spaces. <laughs> um, roughly, what percentage would you say are women, and why is it? Why do we need more women than men? Okay, I, okay. In the organizers team, like we are, like ten organizers, like you know, the big organizers that are always like contacting other organizations or the government, or, you know, stuff like that. We are ten, well, like you know, and only two are men, for example, and the rest we all are women and girls. So it's it's good. Um, why is it good, and why do you think that there aren't more young men involved? Mm, sorry? Um, why, why do you think it's good that there are more women than men? Uh, are there special characteristics that women have? I don't know. I think... Oh, my, my, my dog is barking. Your Tara. Yeah. <laughs> she is barking because my dad, my dad arrived, so she is like, please come. <laughs> That's okay. Get inside. <laughs> but I think that, um, I don't know, maybe I think that it's because we have like more, more leadership. I don't know. I have this feeling that we are maybe like, I don't know, a really good leader that we see environment and nature like of our own because as you, like for example, we say Mother Earth. So I don't know. I think that Earth and environment to us as women, we have a really like different but very important connection that we need to always um, put like you know, um, I don't know how to explain like I don't know like advocate but not advocate but also like say like I don't know how to explain it like oh my god I don't know how to explain it let me think because I don't even know how to explain it in Spanish which is weird <laughs> but I don't like. Yeah, we see the earth and we see, like, we, as women, we see the planet environment and we really, like, it's, like, something that is, like, come, like, inside us and we need to, like, I don't know, to show it to the world, if that makes sense. 
and also because as we all know women is always been really excluded and it's our chance to not only advocate for our rights of women but also as society and to work a better you know have a more time like a better relationship with us because yeah the same system that has always subjugated and oppressed women is the same system that has oppressed society and environment so given this perspective of empowering it like giving a really good um like perspective or idea of how to tackle not only climate crisis but all the injustices that are happening right now mm. Um, do you think of yourself as a feminist? Yeah, I mean, being feminist is not something that you just woke up and, yeah, I'm a feminist. It's something that you need to, first of all, educate. And I think that you need to um, to change a lot of, like, for example, here in Costa Rica, it's a very conservative um, society, really misogynist society. And even my dad, he's not, like, you know, misogynist and he's really open and he's always advocating for equal rights but we have like in our culture some um, micro um, misogynist like I don't know like um, like I don't know how to explain it like ideals or I don't, like I don't know like even how we talk and how we speak or something like that so it's something that you really need to like think about. But yeah, I mean, I'm not feminist in process. Like, I think that you as a woman, you as a person, you are not going to stop learning. And this is how I like even being a feminist works. Because I don't know, I can say that I'm a feminist, but maybe I will say something that is not that, um, I don't know, like, um, I. A really good in terms of uh, I don't know like advocating for human rights or even for equal rights, which is human rights. Oh yeah, I'm a feminist in process. I, I would say that even until the day, until you know my my last day of like you know here in this planet, I would say that I will be a feminist in process because every single day I will learn something and I will become a better um, woman, but also a better um, I, I don't know like friend and. Um, I don't know, like, I don't know how to say, like, being sor like sorority, so sorority, I don't say that in English. When you, so sororial, I don't know how to say it in English. Um, so it's about having integrity and... No, yeah, but, but I don't know how to say it in English. Right. right. Okay, would, yeah. Integrity. Um, okay. So, uh, someone said to me that it's not cool, especially for high school boys, to be an activist. I guess especially an environmental activist. So there's a coolness factor for for guys. Is do you do you see that in play at all or not? No, I think that everyone should be an activist. Everyone should be advocating for what they think that they're that is right, but it actually is right for the you know the common good. But does that make sense? So. If we are a guy in, I don't know, from high school or from elementary school, but you think that you need to advocate for human rights, for environment, because I see environment, when I'm talking about human rights, I'm talking about us environment, because, you know, environment is human rights. So if you think that you need to advocate for human rights, do it. Like, doesn't matter if you are, I don't know, a... A guy that has, I don't know, 12 years old or something that has like 30 years old. But if you want to advocate and try to fight for a better and sustainable and fair society and world, do it. Like, we need you, <laughs> basically. This world needs you. But why aren't there more guys involved? I would say because, I don't know, like... Uh, like I was saying, we as women, we see nature different, and maybe they don't have, like, this real connection, and I know that this is maybe a stereotype, but this is how, like, we we work, like, we actually, as women, we see nature in a different way, and not only nature, but also how we, like, historically, we have been oppressed, so maybe, like, men or boys, they don't have this need, actually need, like, I'm not saying that they don't really have it, but they don't feel like 
at their own site sometimes. Got it. Um, also, you're part of, as well as being a young woman activist, you're a Generation Z activist, and I'm wondering why you think that Gen Z is able to be active so young. I mean, there's, there's kids who are 11 and 12 who have started all kinds of things, and Greta mm -hmm. was 15. Why, why can you be such an active public face generation when other generations couldn't or didn't? I think because I don't know if you have heard this uh, like saying that we, uh, you know, this new generation, we are the last generation to have the ability to save the world. So maybe I think I think that we have taken that into account very serious. Mm. That we are already um, not maybe we're not facing the effects of climate change. For example, I'm not facing it exactly. Like yeah, I have this river nearby my house that really smells so bad, but. I don't live in the coastal area. So what I mean that what we all see and watch on the TV, on Instagram, on our social media about what's happening with the world is like making us realize that we need to do something. But maybe also I would say that we are not like the um like you know the generation that has like you know started this young. But maybe we are the generation that has all the media and it's because how, you know, we have the technology to do it. And maybe that's why. Maybe we are like being like, I don't know, for example, Alexandria Villaseñor, she has like 15 years old and, you know, she's huge. She's advocating for human rights and environment worldwide and she has a lot of attention and it's because she has a phone. She has internet and, you know, different generations didn't have this chance to have, you know, uh, internet, inter internet at really young age. So maybe something, maybe it's because of that. It, it also seems to me that um, this generation is really self-confident. Like um, I asked two 10-year-olds, um, do grown-ups or, ki or kids know more? And they said, well, kids know more. And I said, what do you mean? And they said, well, kids are, know how to be empathetic. So they they really believe that kids are better than adults. So I I, I wonder if you if you think that's true that your generation is is maybe uniquely confident. Yeah, maybe I think that we are maybe not because we want to, but because we needed to. Because if you want to advocate for human rights, like I said, I'm very shy. But I needed to take the risk to um, challenge myself. So I think that every single activist all around the world, or every single activist all around the world is... Sorry, my dad is talking about me. That's okay. Like every, every single activist all around the world needed to like think and say, like, yeah, I need to challenge myself. I need to um, be heard. But if I want to be heard, I need to talk in public. I need to be, in, I don't know, I need to have this ability to, um, I don't know, to someone to follow me. So, yeah, it's something that we, maybe we didn't want to. Like, I didn't want to go and talk, um, like, you know, in public. But I had this need. And this is, like, I think that all my friends and activists that I don't know yet, they feel the same way because it's not easy to talk in public. Like it's not easy. It's very really challenging. You, I, I, for example, when I'm talking in public, I start sweating a lot, and I'm like, no, Sophia, please calm down. Or I'm, I'm, I just start like rambling and talking like nonsense. But I'm like, no, Sophia, you, know, you need to do this. You are empathetic. I think that I'm a really nice person, and I need to tell it. I need to like be able to speak out, to speak up, so, yeah. Um, do you think... And that's what my fellow activists, I think that they have the same idea or, like, the same perspective, I think. Do you think that uh, parenting has changed, that parents are more, um, 
egalitarian, more respectful of, of their kids, less authoritarian than before? Any, any sense that parents have changed? To be honest, mm, maybe. I think it's a really hard question because I have, like, I'm 21 years old and until now, like, well, my mom is, she isn't that, like, that authoritarian, but my dad, he's a lot. So I'm just giving my example, but I think that now um, parents, like, sometimes, not every single parent because we have like different, you know, you know, parents are different, like every single family is different, so every single family is challenging and living in different contexts and different situations. But I think that parents are now more open to see their kids to advocate for what they think that is right. And this is the whole like, you know, the the point of that, the main um like change and I don't know like um like window that even the parents all around the world like sometimes they are being more open and also helping their kids to fight for what they think that is best and right. Mm -hmm. Um do you mostly use Instagram, Twitter, what are where are your uh, most active accounts in terms of educating people about climate? Basically, Instagram. Like, I don't actually know how to use Twitter. It's weird because I'm Gen Z and I don't know how to use Twitter. Funny, though. And I use Facebook, but it's all about memes and talking with my, I don't know, like, mm, professors or something like that because they actually only use Facebook. So I would say that it's only, like, Instagram. Mm -hmm. And how many followers do you have? Like, I don't have, like, a lot. I have, like, 2,000. Yeah, like, 2,000. That's a lot to me. <laughs> <laughs> Where, how did you know Annika, who, in Germany? Oh, I think, uh, I think that she went to COP25. Yeah. But I don't... My father is me, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm kidding. But, um... I I don't like I knew about her, but not at COP twenty five. I knew about her like after um, after COP twenty five. So I think that we met through friends, to like you know through climate activist friends that we have in common, and yeah. Did you go to um, Madrid for COP? Yeah, I did. Ah, oh, and how how did you get? In, in encouraged to go all the way to Madrid and what what were your observations? Basically, my mom. My mom said like, hey, you should go. Like, I had this opportunity. The government gave me the opportunity to go as part of their official delegation, as part of like a young youth delegation, if that makes sense, in Costa Rica. So they gave me the, you know, the spot and like it was like a alliance between the government and UNICEF Costa Rica. So they gave like like they said we're going to give five spots for young activists. So you are one of them. Do you want to go? So I was like think about thinking about it because last in um back in December and in December I have finals. So I'm like, no, I'm going to miss all my final. I shouldn't go, like, no. So, but at the end, I'm also like, no, you, like, you earn it. You need to go. So I went, basically. <laughs> and what, I know a lot of people, young people who went were kind of, um, I don't know, disgusted maybe, too strong a word, <clears throat> but they weren't impressed with what, what they saw. What about you? I wasn't impressed, to be honest, because... I, when you heard about COP25, you, like, everyone was talking about how ambitious it was and that we were able to um, negotiate Article 6, but the, at the end, it wasn't, like, you know, at the end, Article 6 has a lot of flaws and has, like, you know, to negotiate and to, like, to really decide what's going to happen with Article 6, you need a lot of agreement, you need a lot of consensus, and... With COP25, 
the you know the international community failed. So if we are talking about going towards a better sustainable and fair society, we need to have a really um, settled carbon emission um, economy. And Article 6 is all about carbon emission economy, and we don't have a really um, ambitious and also um, economy. Like, I don't, I, I, we don't have this economy, but we have this carbon emission economy, but it's not also like um, helping human rights. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of strategies mm -hmm. or, or tactics did um, Fridays for Future and other groups that in Madrid used to try to influence COP? Oh, we did um, a strike inside COP. We did a, a strike inside COP, you know, the conference. We also held um, meetings, like, you know, internal negotiations about what we want to do and how we're going to do it. And also, um, we, like, like, you know, maybe not Fridays itself, we have, but we have a lot of, like, I don't know, like, chances and opportunities in um, panels, in side events, and stuff like that. And what other groups were um, representing youth besides Fridays for Future? Uh, I saw people of Extinction Rebellion. I saw, um, I, I don't know, like, you know, at top you have um, the UN agencies, but you also have, like, the government delegations, and you have a lot of observers. So... I saw people also from Greenpeace, from, um, which else? I, I think that I saw, I met people that is part of um, Zero Hour Movement. Not, I, I, like Jamie, she didn't go to COP25, but I met people from Zero Hour. So Zero Hour was there too. Um, a lot of like the small but local or even national, um, like you know, climate activism movements and groups that I don't really remember the name. But we basically like they basically um, went to COP25 as a server, so maybe they didn't want like, yes, yeah, my badge says that I'm part of Friday, but they were representing what like, Friday for so what Station Rebellion is. Mm -hmm. And how would you say that, say, Extinction Rebellion or Greenpeace, their tactics are different? Or what, what makes them set apart from Fridays for Future? How are the approaches different? I think that what is, like, what, okay, with Extinction Rebellion, Extinction Rebellion, as you know, the name says, is more like... Rebellion, <laughs> I don't know how to explain it, like they do these protests that are really, sometimes are really, are really shocking. Like I've seen like this massive protest about people like hanging and like trying to see, like to like compare what's happening with the climate, but like hanging, I don't know, it's weird. And for example, Friday for Future, very like pacific, you just walk and strike with a sign. But with Central Rebellion, they're always doing these protests that sometimes are really, like, shocking. And you're like, no, don't do that. You can, like, harm yourself or something. And with Greenpeace, they are more into the biodiversity and ecosystem, um, like, topics. Not if, and, for example, Fire the Future is more to, um, the, to, like, advocate for governments to declare climate emergency. And Greenpeace is more to protect um, the Arctic, protect the Amazon, I don't know, but like, at the end we all like always get together and fight together, strike together. Mm. Um, do, you, do you think that there's hope? Are you optimistic or pessimistic when you think about the, the what, the 11 years that scientists say we have to turn this around well we? i think that we ha we have hope like okay we are already facing the effects of climate change so it's like for example 
Like people used to say that if we stop our emissions right now, we are going to stop the climate effect, right? Like, you know, now and we are not going to face climate change ever again, which is not true because, you know, climate change is, that is something that is natural for our, of our environment, of our planet. Our planet is constantly changing. The problem is that we and our economic and political system is helping, is increasing these emissions of greenhouse um, gases and, you know, the water, you know, stuff, you know, you know what I'm talking about. So the problem is that we stop now, we have a lot of effects that are already happening. And these effects will continue for about, like, maybe three decades or more. But when I see that, I, I have hope is because maybe, yeah, will we, like, we as, I don't know, like, we are an activist, we are um, challenging the governments, we are challenging even, you know, big leaders. And we are challenging big leaders all around the world. And this is like, this is giving me hope because you are seeing people from all around the world challenging even their president and in, by giving us this idea that we can, if we do it from the multilateralism, from not, you know, only, um, I don't know, young people, but also we need, um, you know, more experienced people with these topics. We need everyone on board. And this is how we, like, I don't know if you have seen, but with this COVID pandemic, we, like, the international community is, like, uniting and is doing all that we can and, and they can to tackle it, to overcome this pandemic. So I see that this crisis, this pandemic crisis, is also giving the hope that we have the tools, but we what we need is the political willingness. Yeah, and that's, that's why yeah. we're, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and that's why we, not only as young activists, but, you know, the entire activism all around the world is doing, to say, to be heard and to like say, yeah, we have all the tools, we have the science, but what we need, what we have, what we actually need is you, your leaders, no, and global leaders, to do politics basically. And yeah, but I mean, I I have hope. Like we are, oh uh, yeah, maybe this. I mean, I don't know. Someday, um, I don't know. Maybe I'm going to be the president of Costa Rica. I don't know. Like this. Newer generations are going to be the the uh, the future global leader. So yeah, this is all about. Right, but we only have eleven years or ten yeah. years, so, so we we don't it's have time. It's up to the yeah. It's up it's up to the um, actual and current leaders. Um, how do you coordinate Fridays for Future globally? I mean, do you, how do you stay in touch? How do you plan global events? How much um, organization is there that ties all the different groups together? We have a lot. When I'm saying that we have a lot, it's because we actually have a lot of group chats. Like in, I don't know, group chats on Instagram, Telegram, and Snapchat, even WhatsApp. So we are always like, we have... I, I don't know, people that are always helping with social media content, not only national, but international. We have some, like, groups about doing press release, I don't know, materials. We have people always doing research and talking to politics all around the world. So we have our internal or national or even local organization, but we have, like, a spoken person to, um, I don't know, to serve as a link between what's happening as, you know, as an international, um, like, sphere to connect it with the national, but also, um, like, sending the national demands to the international, um, like, movement. So who, who organizes? Who says, okay, we're going to have a chat to talk about our next strike, and we're going to talk at this time on... What's up or whatever? Who who initiates it? Anyone like basically, if you have the idea, you can say it. 
and I don't know if someone's going, maybe it's going to be held by, um, I don't know, elections or just like, you know, through messages that, yeah, you have a good idea, you have a good point, we should do it. Like, we don't have this board, I don't know if that makes sense. We just have like people that is interested about something, so um, this person is going to say what he, she, they wants to do. So, if the, you know, if a lot of people agree with that, it's going to happen, I don't know. Like, we don't have this, like, specific person saying that, yeah, I'm going to create this group about this and this and that. It's just basically if I have this, um, I don't know, idea or, I don't know, um, objective, I'm just going to put it out in those um, groups. And I know that some, like, you know, a group of persons will join me. Basically, like we don't have a real like organization. We are just, you know, a lot of activists all around the world trying to connect every time. Basically, wow. So, in in one of those chats, roughly, would there be like one person represents each country, and and they would talk, or how how is it? How many people, and how do you organize a big group chatting? It depends about how, uh, you know, every single chapter of Fridays um, organized. For example, um, like in the, like I'm part of the Latin American group chat and our Friday for Future Costa Rica said that we need just three representatives in that group. But sometimes you can't like have a lot of like, I don't know, I am in this open group chat of like, you know, Friday for Future, but but as, you know, the whole movement, and I'm not only, like, I'm not the only person from Costa Rica, like, in this group chat, we are about, like, 20, I don't know, people from Costa Rica in the same group chat, so it's basically how, like, as national, like, I don't know how to explain it, like, uh, I don't know how to explain it, like, basically depends on how your chapter is organizing and how your chapter wants to be involved with the international, um, you know, movement, but it's not something that we have some rules that, yeah, because, I don't know, in this social media group, we only need one person per country. No, no, no. It's basically how the country wants to do it. Mm. And it, does Greta's voice heard, or does she enter in, or she's too busy to enter in the chats? Where, what role does Greta play at this point? She is in some group chats. She's not in every single one of those group chats. But she's really open when, I don't know, she is in, like, I don't know how many group chats, but she's, like, always talking and helping. And, like, in terms of Friday the Future, we don't see Greta as, wow, Greta. I don't know if that makes sense. We just see her as another activist fella that is also helping to fight for a better for climate justice we don't see her as a like you know as a leader i mean we see her as a leader because you know she found the movement but we don't see her as something that we actually need to worship and like she's in a different like you know i'm here and she's here no no like we are like in the same level so she's always interacting and um talking and discussing and you know it's like Another activist, basically. So I'm not clear. Let, let's say I think people were going to organize on Earth Day globally last April. It, there was going to be a big Earth Day thing, and then because of the pandemic, it didn't happen. But who, who decides that? How is it decided this day that we're going to do a big global action? We basically have, um, like... Zoom call, basically that. Like, if we're going to have a Zoom call about what we're going to do for Earth Day, you know, the all the countries interested, please join. That's it. Like, yeah, it's all about Zoom calls or Skype. You know, basically just having open calls with all the activists or the countries that are interested. Wow. But isn't that chaotic, and is there a moderator or facilitator who says, okay, you can talk now, and you've been talking too much, and we have... Uh, yeah. We have to moderate, like, I don't know, if I want to moderate, I will just, like, say it and say, like, hey, I want to moderate this call. 
Are you okay with it? Yeah, okay. I will do it. So when you're on a global call, like roughly how many people would be in the chat? To be honest, I have no idea. Because <laughs> we're talking about is a lot of countries involved but yeah the more like we you can see the presentation from all around the world like you can see the presentation from Oceania, Latin America, North America, Europe, Africa, Asia so you can see the presentation from all around the world which is good but I can like I can give you a exact number because it depends on the activity depends if the is you know this activity is going to be on like um, I don't know, like, if they, like, I don't know, like, depends about, like, time hours, I don't know, because sometimes it happens that we have all these Zoom calls, but are not, like, very, um, good in terms of, for example, Latin America, because, I don't know, like, basically, the Zoom calls are always, like, based and the time is always, like, yeah, we are going to do it, but with the European time. So for us as Latin America, you in the Pacific coast, the hour is not going to be very accessible for us. So it depends about who is go like the hour of this call depends about the topic because if we're talking about fossil fuels, maybe all the countries are going to be interested. But we are talking about um I don't know something that is happening in the Arctic. I don't know. Maybe Latin America is not going to be interested because we already have some uh, different, um, I don't know, files. So it depends about, you know, the hour that are, these calls are happening and also the topic. It depends about how global is this topic. Like, I'm not saying that, it's because, for example, if something about the Arctic, I'm not saying that Costa Rica is, not, is definitely not going to be interested. Maybe we are, but it is not going to be like all the Latin American countries, for example. Got so it depends it. about, you know, our and the topic. What, what about people who don't speak English? Because it seems like most of the organizing is done in English. Is that right? Yeah. Basically, everything is in, everything is in English. Everything. So that's why, uh, you know, every single chapter, we say chapters, so when we say, like, every single Friday in, you know, different countries. We have like in our internal organization, we say like, yeah, Sofia, so you kind of speak English, so please, you can represent Costa Rica in this call. So we are basically always um, like contacting people that already speak, you know, English or sometimes French or sometimes, you know, different languages to be the representative in that specific topic or call. But yeah, everything is basically in English, which is, Sometimes it's not that inclusive because we, I mean, I know a lot of amazing activists here in Latin America that they have a lot of potential. Not only, I mean, not potential of like, you know, be famous. No, potential of um, be heard and advocate for what's right for their country, but they have this huge barrier, which is language. They don't speak English, so they can be heard. If they want to be heard, they need to, um, I don't know, contact someone that will help them with the language barrier. But yeah, this is a huge problem that, for example, here in Latin America, we always have this like, um, like I don't, I don't say like this, like constantly conflict between the international movement and our regional movement because I mean we. Basically, our negotiations and what our Zoom calls or calls are being held in, in Spanish, and sometimes it would, in Portuguese, if we have the presence of someone from Brazil, but not every single one in that group chat, you know, from Latin America speaks English. So we are always having this conflict of how we are going to connect with the international movement if, first of all, we don't, we are not, um, you know, our nation doesn't speak English as their first language. So, yeah, we're always having this conflict about who are we going to send to those calls and why, and do we really want to do this because they always are having, um, you know, the calls in English, so it's not, maybe, it's not maybe accessible for us, 
but maybe yeah I speak English so it's accessible for me but they are not including my background sometimes because maybe uh, okay I speak English but sometimes I'm not I'm not have this uh, capability to express myself as as what I really want to do it because maybe I have the you know the vocabulary but my brain doesn't like switch you know so it's sometimes it's different and it's difficult and you can say it like you can see it right now because I have a lot of maybe I have a lot of things that I really want to say but my brain is not switching to English so it's always confusing and here in Latin America and I know that we're all always happening that countries that don't really speak English as their first language are always having this conflict about how to do it, how to be involved in this international movement because this international movement is monolingual and it's all about English. Mm. It, it seems to me a, another Latin American issue is environmentalists get killed. <laughs> I mean it has yeah, some of the right. most, the, the most, you know, people who are protecting indigenous land or preventing mining or something it, I think it has the highest rate of, of murders so do you ever feel yeah. threatened or it, Costa Rica is not that no way. in Costa Rica okay here in Latin America of course being an activist means threat and even death you know being an activist here you are putting yourself at risk but here in Costa Rica not exactly like yeah we have a lot of not, not a lot we, we have like some cases and you know um, with this like you know conflicts and that has happened in the past for example a couple of years ago this guy from Limon, Limonza province in the coastal you know it's all about you know the Caribbean and he was a tortor uh, a how do I say it in English tortuga I don't know if I tortuga is turtle Tur yeah, turtle. I don't know. Sometimes my tongue gets like <laughs> weird. So I can pronounce very. I can pronounce that. You know that word right. But yeah, he was a turtle defender in in you know this big um, enterprise. Actually, killed him because you know he was defending turtles in our Caribbean coastal you know area. I don't know. And we have a lot of, well, not a lot of, but some cases that indigenous people are being killed and murdered because they are protecting their lands. But it's basically more with the indigenous fight, not as me, as a non-indigenous Costa Rican. Because, yeah, I live in the city and I get a lot of criticism, like, yeah, why are you doing this? Costa Rica is a really great country. You don't need, you don't need to fight for it. Costa Rica is good. We are saving the planet. This is like I I'm always getting from people. But I'm not I'm I I don't I don't feel threat, for example. So I know that in countries, for example, Colombia, you don't have to be an indigenous defender to have your life being in danger. You know, in Colombia everything mostly every single activist, no matter their background, they have this um, possibility of have their life in danger, but here in Costa Rica, not exactly. So it's only if we are fighting for like in a specific cause. For example, this guy, all in the you know the tutor, tor, how do you say it? Turtle, turtle, <laughs> turtle. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why. I don't like in Spanish. We don't have that sound, so sometimes it gets confused. But, you know, there's a specific fight in being indigenous. Like, here in Costa Rica, if you see cases about um, defenders being murdered, it's because they are indigenous. They are not, um, as like, you know, not, if you are not an indigenous, your life is actually not being in danger because you are an activist. Got it. Are, but are, in the old Latin American region, being an activist means danger, basically. Are there other... Latin American issues for organizers besides threat of violence and language issue, uh, other things that are kind of on the plate of Latin American activists? Oh, a lot of criticism. Like, I know this is something that's happening worldwide, but here in Latin America, we don't have this culture about um, advocating for environment as the global north is doing it, or maybe we have. But 
since okay, these five, this um, this five in Latin America is always like being held held by indigenous people. So we know that indigenous people is a very systematic and institutionalized excluded population. So we can start with that. You know, the real defenders of the planet are being excluded of not only their internal local um, decision making process, but also at the global, which is a really, really good, uh, a really, really good topic to talk about. And it's very, um, you know, it's very bad. Does that make sense? It's very, um, I don't know how to explain it. Like, it's very, uh, I don't know, like, I don't know, it's bad. Like, yeah, the real defenders are the ones who, you know, the real defenders, the real um, group that are leading this, this fight. And it's not something that very new for to them. They are, they have been doing this for um, ages, decades, centuries, you know. But now they like until now they are they are being excluded. So this is something that maybe not is not only happening in North America, but it is like my background. Like yeah, I'm I'm basically here in Latin America. I'm basically white, if that makes sense. Like I'm not indigenous. I'm not exactly people of color, so yeah, I have these all these opportunities to go to COP25, to speak to my president, to, I don't know, you know, something like that, but I'm not the real defender here. I mean, I'm, I'm being an activist, but my, my relationship with nature is completely different, and it's not exactly part of my tradition as an indigenous person, and those who are Actually, the real defenders are being excluded, and this is a really huge problem for a lot of America. Mm. Like, yeah, if you talk with someone in Brazil, they are going to talk about all this oppression with indigenous people from the Amazonia. So, absolutely, or, you know, in Peru, you know, playing with the with the Andes, and, you know. Yeah, got it. Um, when. Uh, earlier movements, social movements, like the second wave of the feminism, they were really influenced by books. Mm -hmm. Books really changed people's understanding. But with this wave of activism, I don't hear books, I hear social media. So I wonder if there are, in fact, books that really have influenced your thinking about activism. Yeah, I mean, I, I... I'm a student of political science, so in my daily basis, I'm reading a lot and a lot. So I have a really good influence of um, Marxism. I know it's very, it's like very, sometimes very like conflicted to some people and groups because, yeah, you are, you are leftist, yay, which I'm not. But I have a lot of like influence of the Marxism, of the ideal of, um, fighting, you know, for social justice and, and the whole ideal and conception of Marxism. But also I read a lot of, for example, I love Naomi Klein. I really love Naomi Klein. She's like my favorite, one of my favorite journalists ever. Yeah. And yeah, I love um, Jeffrey Sash. He's an economist. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you know, you, you know about him. Actually, I met him at COP25, which is so funny. <laughs> I was having um, dinner, and he was, like, just walking walking by and saying, like, oh, my God, I'm Jeffrey Sash. So I went, and we were talking about, like, have an hour, which was good. So I have a lot of influence, but exactly, uh, I have a lot of influence about um, indigenous, um, like, Latin America, indigenous, um, um, like, books and I don't know how to say it, like cosmovision. Like in my um, major we studied we had a whole year about Latin American theory and knowledge. So I'm really I'm like maybe I'm I have like I haven't like read a lot of like how to be an activist book, but all my ideals are, you know, I got it from what I read about um, Latin American cosmovision, about the Marxism, even only claim for Howie. So, yeah. 
Mm, got it. Um, so, in um, in in terms of what kind of uh, job you have in the future, you you said you you'd really like to work for a human rights organization. So that would be doing policy or advocacy or doing what? I like research, basically. I I don't like to. I mean, I'm studying political science, and then I find out like you know giving my knowledge to to know how to do policies, you know. But I don't actually like that. I'm more likely to have a job for I don't know doing research about what's happening. I don't know in Latin America and I don't know oil disasters, for example, or what's happening with the conflict between um, Israel and, I don't know, you know, something like that. I'm more into, like, um, doing research and putting that out. Like, yeah, this is happening in Latin America. This is happening in Australia, I don't know. This is happening in U.S. right now. So, yeah, you can read it. <laughs> because I think that, you know, the most important key for everything is education and knowledge. And doing research is you know, give you the opportunity to not only have this information for the, you know, your peers and the, the academy, because something that is really important is when you have this knowledge, you need to share it. You need to do it public. And I think that doing research will give me this um, chance to, in, to, I don't know, to give this information to, you know, the entire world. So that's why I want to I don't know, like do research about human rights. So that's why I want to, I don't know, someday work at Human Rights Watch. <laughs> Got it. Um, okay, I'm ending up here soon. Uh, uh, in the U.S., a major issue is increasing numbers of teens with anxiety and depression, especially teenage girls. And I wondered, especially since your mother works in, in mental health, um, do you hear people talk about that in, in, in circles that you know, or is that more of a U.S. problem? No, I think it's, it's something that's happening more while. Like, sometimes I need to have a break, even like me, I need to have a break from activism. Like, sometimes I really get so burned out. Like, no, I can't do this anymore. So, like, for example, the, like, two weeks, I don't know, like, I don't know, like, a couple of weeks ago, I did have this break because I was burned out. I had a lot of um, exams, I had a lot of, like, organizing stuff to do. So before, you know, after that, I said, no, I need a break for everything because I was getting really anxious. And I know that I'm getting, I'm getting like, really anxious because I start having, like, breakouts, you know, like, acne and pimples and fits and, you know, stuff like that. So I knew that. And I started, uh, I, I, I stopped eating, so I knew I was having these really bad, anxious, um, like, um, like, you know, I don't know how to explain it, like, weak. So I said, no, I need a break. And something, like, something that is always, like, the, um, like, the target of what, like, always, like, makes me feel anxious is because, I don't know. I started reading about what's happening in the, in the entire planet, and I know that here in Costa Rica, I can do nothing, for example, or that I don't have, like, for example, I don't have, um, like, real connections with my government, so I can really stop this referendum, or I don't know what happened, what is happening right now in the U.S. is also, like, triggering me a lot, not only because, yeah, it's happening in the U.S., but it's also happening here in Latin America, for example. You mean so the black like, the Black Lives yeah. Matter, yeah. Yeah, the this um, anti racist um, fight is not only happening and maybe it started in the US, but it's something that's happening global. So here in Costa Rica something that really triggered me a couple of weeks ago is because the government of um, Nicaragua is doing nothing to overcome the pandemic. So, of course, the people in Nicaragua will migrate to Costa Rica to have a better chance to overcome, you know, this pandemic. But here, the society in Costa Rica is very xenophobic. 
So they are saying that, yeah, we are actually increasing our, um, our curve of, you know, COVID positive um, cases and stuff. But they are saying that it's all about, you know, default is all about these Nicaraguans coming to Costa Rica. And that triggers me a lot because I know that it's not their fault, it's, you know, the government's fault. But we're a very xenophobic country. So, yeah, I mean, advocating for human rights is really, really, you know, gets you a really, really inside anxiety moment. Like, you have a lot, you, like, you want to do everything, but at the end you can do the minimum, and this is always really stressful. So, yeah, it's something that is not happening in the global north, but here in Latin America, like, with everything that we are facing, all, all our conflicts, I don't, I don't know, when all these bushfires in the Amazonian happened, happened in my birthday week, it was something really sad because I was so happy to, you know, yay, it's my birthday. But this, you know, Amazonian bushfires happened and I was so burned out and I was so sad that I didn't enjoy my birthday. So, yeah, it's not something that is only, like, only happening in the U.S. It's happening worldwide in, to, every, to everyone. Mm. Um, academics in, in the U.S. say that part of the anxiety is due to social media and body image and popularity issues. This girl has these great Photoshop pictures on Instagram and gets all these likes and I don't have it and I don't look it too good. My body mm -hmm. is... So is, is that an issue as well? For me, not exactly because I see social media as a really good tool to um, be heard, but also as a really dangerous tool because if you don't use it wisely, it, get, it can like help you like negative to um, start having anxiety uh, moment, anxiety uh, episodes. So yeah, I know. I mean, for me, it's not like something that really um, like affects me. Like I maybe I know how to work with social media, but I know that it, this is a global problem that maybe some all around the world, what they are doing is to try to get cloud, not in an activism as itself, but you know, in every single aspect in that in life, they're trying to get cloud, and if they don't like achieve that, this is going to trigger them a really um, a stressful anxiety episode, which is totally right, and it's all about how social media works, because social media works by life, by getting attention by gaining followers and if you don't um I don't know do a balance between your personal life and your public life in social media can be chaotic definitely do you so do you know girls who are in fact um their self-esteem is harmed by their social media use not not in terms of activism but in terms of popularity and appearance yeah, actually, I have friends that they are always trying to gain followers, and when them when and when they like did like they don't achieve like the certain amount of followers that they I don't know that I don't know they posted a picture, so I don't know they wanted to have more than one hundred followers I don't know, but they they didn't get it. They are going to feel sad and they are going to you know, delete that picture, and I'm like, dude, okay, you look pretty, don't worry about the likes, it's all about how you feel with that picture, for example. Got it. But boys aren't as affected by it. Young men aren't as affected. No, I think they are, sometimes. Like, social media is something that is worldwide. Well, no, it's worldwide, but not everyone has the chance. You know, there is also a techno technological gap, but I would say that... Yeah, men can also be affected about social media and how, you know, they are doing it with it. Like, how they are, um, I don't know, um, interacting with the social media, with Instagram, with, in, I don't know, Facebook, Twitter. It's not something that is only specific for women, it's also for men and for the other gender, you know, that, we, that exist. So everyone is, um, can be hard about, so, uh, you know about their relation with social media, everyone. Like, 
Okay. It's nothing. It's not something about gender or sex. It's something about being human. Got it. Um, is there anything that you'd like to add about how to be an effective organizer, activism, make change? Anything about Gen Z or young women that we haven't talked about that you think should be included? I don't know. Like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Maybe that we need more women, but I said this earlier. So, yeah, we need more young leaders in to be women to be changing the planet because. I don't know who said this. Um, I think there was Mary Robinson. Uh, she said that we need more women in the making decision process to not only to um, overcome the climate crisis, but also all the injustices. Because we as women, like I said before, we see oppression in a different way. And we have this really bond, like this really direct bond between all the different ways of oppression. So, yeah, we need to more women, basically. <laughs> you know, it's, and don't be afraid. It's interesting to me that um, in terms of the response to the, um, the killing of George Floyd in the U.S., it was women leaders who spoke up. The mayor of Atlanta was really outspoken. Mm -hmm. the, the mayor of D.C. was really spoke, outspoken. The head of the council in Minneapolis, they're all mm -hmm. women who took a strong stand. So that, that, that seemed interesting to me, that it was women who had the courage to speak up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same. The way, it's because all, it's all about, like I said, we see oppression in a different perspective that no man will see it. Interesting. So, yeah. I don't know, it's my, it's like my perspective. Like, we see oppression as part, sadly, as part of our historical um, fight. So, we need to speak up. Yes. 